around 2000, I would say 14, 15, I decided I wanted to write a book. I think that's when it was. I'm not sure. I just know I wanted to write a book. I'm working on the book right now. I'm taking a break right now to write the book. I got the idea several years ago I wanted to write it. At the time, I didn't know what I wanted to write about. I thought I wanted to write about the relationship that I was in because I wasn't happy, but I didn't resent the relationship. I knew the person that I was with, I wasn't going to be with long term, but I didn't have a good enough reason to walk away. Like I wanted to build a case or if I couldn't find a case to build, I would have just sabotaged it because that's what I would do. That's what, I, that's what I've done. Like when I want to get out of something, I just sabotage it because I don't know how to go in the next room and say, look, I really thought I wanted to be with you, but something happened the other day and I don't like the way it made me feel and I don't think I'm going to be able to give 100% around here anymore. So can we go our separate ways? Like I don't know how to do that. One, because I don't want to be alone selfish god that's selfish completely selfish but who don't stay in something because they don't want to be alone plenty of people do it all the time during the pandemic marriage there's a bunch of people that's married and they stay despite the person hitting them despite the person uh cheating on them despite the person uh, abusing them despite despite the person having a drug habit Gambling habit, like you, 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 you justify a reason to stay, just like you justify a reason why you break up when you don't have a reason. It's easier to sabotage something than it is to walk in the next room and say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. But I thought I wanted to write about that relationship because I didn't want to be in it. But I couldn't think of a reason to say I wanted to be out of it. Plus, I was getting older, so I was this fear of, like, being a certain age and single. You hear all the rumors and the horror stories of how you can't date over 40, and it's hard to date over 40 because of this and that and whatever. And that was a concern, and I just wasn't happy. And we had gone to therapy, and I wanted to, you know, you thought, you know, going to therapy would help it. But it had gotten to the point where I didn't want help to make me fall back in love with this person. Because I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't fallen in love with the person. I hadn't fallen in love with anyone in a long time. But I wasn't in love with this person. It was like, if love is a tear you're trying to reach, I had gotten as high as I could in the military of love as I was going to get with her in terms of how much I was going to invest in the relationship. Like, if like is a tier, I had gotten as high in the like ranking as I was going to get with her because the next tier was love and I did not feel safe loving her. I write to music. Like right now I'm in a hotel in Washington, D.C. And it's to get away. I can't write when I'm at home. People don't, people don't care that I say, hey, I'm writing. I need to be left alone. It doesn't matter. That's, that don't mean anything to anybody because writing doesn't mean anything to people. Like writing is like they see the finished product, like leaving you alone so you can write. Few and far between, you know. And I'm here writing so I can get away. Because when I'm in town and when I'm in L.A., I can't write. Auditions, the manager will call, agent will call, they'll tell you they want you to go audition for something, comedy show, somebody will reach out to you, text you, email you, like, or stop by. And I try to tell people, if you let me do what I need to do, I can be what you need me to be in the moments in which you need me to be it. But if you try to pull me out of my element when I want to do something, you're not getting full attention. You're probably getting 35% of my attention, maybe 20, depending on my interest in the relationship between me and that person, whether intimate 
or friendship. But I needed to get out of the city to write. And I wanted to listen to music, but it's hard to listen to music because I try to listen to music that will trigger things in me so I can write about whatever was going on during that time period. And I really want to listen to Jill Scott right now. But I won't. But I need to. I won't listen to Jill because... I discovered Jill Scott when I was in college. Who is Jill Scott was the name of her first album. Her commercially released album. I think she had a previous album on Hidden Beach Records that got released years later. And I fell in love with Jill Scott. It was something about her voice, what she was saying, how she talked, how she spoke of love, how she how she articulated how she loved somebody, how she like it was a couple's album, if you will. Like, it starts off with her single or, you know, building a relationship. And then you just go through these stages of love and ups and downs or the deepening of love in the, in, in the relationship through this album. At the time I was in college, I had met somebody that the moment I saw them, I was like, I don't even believe in marriage. But I believe I made myself believe in it because I was living. I'm from the South, and I was forced to be Baptist. I was forced to be Christian. I was forced to go to church. I was forced to listen to gospel music. Like religion was not an option for me, so I was forced to be a Southern Baptist black boy. If you want to get a Southern Baptist black girl, but I was forced to be the Southern kid. And I didn't really believe in marriage because my parents' marriage didn't work out. And if the fucking prototype or the first thing you see that is, you know, marriage for you and it doesn't work for you, why the fuck would you think it'll work for yourself? Not everybody thinks like that, but that's me thinking. But when I saw her, I was like, yo, I'm, in, I'm 20, but that right there, I could, I could do that for however long I'm going to live. And I had never felt like that about anybody in the state of mind where I understood what I was saying. Like high school, I dated my high school sweetheart and I thought I wasn't married her, but I was doing it because that's all I knew. You marry, sometimes you're in a relationship out of comfort and, you know, routine. People think, you know, trust is built off a of routine. Like, I trust my husband or my boyfriend because he has the same routine. There's no way he could do anything. It breeds like you, you you become relaxed and you're like, he has a routine. He's not going to go off that routine. I know the routine, so there's no way he'd do anything. But I was willing to be in this relationship with this woman. And I didn't have a problem expressing it to her or publicly. Like, I was like drunk off of love. And Jill Scott was the soundtrack for that drunkenness. Like, the entire relationship was songs sung to, sung by Jill Scott. Like if our relationship was a movie, Jill Scott did the soundtrack for it. And I love Jill Scott. Like when I listen to Jill Scott, I'm in a, I was in a relationship. Like I feel like I'm in a relationship with Jill. Like what she's saying, she's saying to me because that's how I want to feel and experience and express love. Exclusively, that song, dope. Long Walk, He Loves Me, especially different every time. Like, first of all, Jill is beautiful to me. I'm from the South. She's a thick woman. Beautiful, sexy, sassy, funny, smart. I remember I, I auditioned for... Craig Robinson had a show on NBC called Mr. Robinson. It was like, it lasted 30 minutes. But I had an audition for it, and Jill Scott came in to audition for it. And I saw her in the room, and I wanted to be like, I've been dating you in my mind, in my heart, since 2000. Because I was in love with Jill. But at the same time, I was falling in love with this woman. And then we separated. Like, I came to LA, she stayed behind. But we always stayed in contact with each other. Like, we didn't break up on bad terms. It wasn't like, 
it was just more like, I know you need to go, go. And I went. But she was always that person I felt like, if I didn't marry anybody, I would marry her. Not to say I was going out here to try to find somebody and I didn't find anybody. Then I would come back and get her because that's not the case. It just never panned out where we could be in the same space at the same time. And I was still I'm still figuring out what, well, I think I figured out now, but I was chasing what I wanted to be in life. And, you know, I, I couldn't ask someone to come chase my dream with me. I couldn't ask someone to come chase me. Like, come come with me as I try to find me. I couldn't, that's not fair to her. And I came to L.A., but we stayed in contact. Over the years, we stayed in contact. Like, I made sure that I kept that relationship. I made sure, even though I would be in other relationships with people, I let that person know, you know, I still love you the same as I did the day I met you. It'll never change. It'll never go away. And I meant, I meant, I meant every word and we you know we wish each other birthday every year I think we probably missed like once or twice but recently I'm not gonna say how recent but recently we had a conversation that basically ended with us or her saying she doesn't think that we would ever get together. Like, that unspoken net to catch you in case you fall was gone. And I mean that in the most non-toxic, you know, way. Like, I'm not saying, God, my blanket gone. It's just like that person that you felt like loved you for who you are and what you are, or at least you thought, that person will always be there. Like, other people can try to love you for who you are, but this person really knows you. And I've known this person since I was 20. You know, I've known her over 15 years. Like, she's seen my success. She remembered me when I was just a dude who wanted to do what he's doing now. And when we stopped talking, or when we wouldn't talk, before we officially decided we wasn't gonna talk anymore, I would listen to Jill and think of her. And that would be completely unfair to anybody because I would like be in relationships and women would wanna listen. I even went to a concert, a Jill Scott concert, and I shouldn't, the person I went to the concert with is the person that I shouldn't have gone to the concert with because the concert didn't mean anything to me because the person that I was with, I was not passionate about that person. Like I did not enjoy the Jill Scott concert. It was Robert Glasper, Lupe Fiasco. Like it was a dope concert. And I'm like in a room with a woman that I love and I would have much rather been at this venue with the woman, with the woman that is the reason why I love Jill and the reason why I love her is because of Jill. And it was just a, it was an incomplete meal and I was not satisfied. But I saw Jill, I just didn't enjoy Jill the way I would, like I dreamed I would enjoy Jill. Like it wasn't love involved in it. I was just seeing Jill Scott. I wasn't passionate about it. Like I sang the song, but I sang the song thinking about the other person. And I thought about how I couldn't tell her that I had seen Jill Scott because that's something that we should have done or c could have done. And it never happened. So I felt like I did something without her that I was supposed to do with her. And then just the years started to pile up. And we kind of drifted apart, even in friendship, it drifted apart. And I had to get to the point where I wanted to listen to Jill again without thinking about her. Because if I couldn't have her, I needed, to, I needed to keep something. I needed to keep, if I couldn't keep her, I needed to keep Jill. Because Jill made me feel alive. 
Nietzsche says this. He says you have to find something that is worth living so you don't kill yourself. That's me in a nutshell. Like every day I wake up trying to find a reason to live because I lose interest or it doesn't or whatever whatever society says is supposed to be the reason why you should want to live that ain't enough for me sometimes like creating trying to find the next song to make me feel alive means something trying to find the next passion to give my heart a jolt a defibrillator punch if you will I look for those things to give me a uh, like now you're alive ah you know Jill is one of those things that made me feel alive. Like I love listening to Jill. Like when I listen to Jill, it renews my belief that the love that I had with this person that I no longer will ever speak to again, I can create that with somebody and it will be obtainable. But I love Jill and I had to figure out a way to listen to Jill without being triggered, without being reminded, without reliving. Because I don't want to love that person anymore. I wish I could. I wish I could, like, keep that person here and keep Jill, but I can't have the the two in the same room. You, You can't. It's hard. And Jill is triggering, and I need, and I, but I need to listen to Jill, so I can feel alive, so I can feel like my love meter is replenished, or like you know, there's a piece of wood thrown on the fire because the fire is low, very like the fire is going out, and I need something to throw on the fire to make me think about there's still a possibility, you know. And that's why I'm writing. Like, I think I'll, I'm going to write about the fact that I'm trying to wing myself and separate the two. Like, if I don't listen to music with a woman, I'm not into that person because I don't think you're worth sharing music with. Because music is a love language for me. A complete love language for me. But I... Jill is a trigger. Jill is an emotional trigger. Jill really, really is an emotional trigger for me. And I have to, like, build up the endurance. I got to build up. I have to train. I have to, like, make myself listen to it and make myself have thoughts that don't make me depressed and sad and and hurt. But even without the person that I fell in love with when I was listening to Jill, there's still aspects of Jill's music that cause me pain because it's painful to hear her sing about some of the stuff because one, I don't have it. Two, you can hear her passion for it and, it, and that makes you feel it. And it's like, it's Jill, man. So that's a complete woman. She's funny, she's full, she's talented, she's sexy, you know? And I had to, I needed that back. Like, I need to be able to listen to slowly, surely, you know, magic number. I, I, I need to be able to listen to those songs and not feel bad about it. But I want to write about it. Like, I wish I could get paid to write about what emotional feelings albums make you feel where where they put you where do they where do they place you because anytime i listen to that album it places me in the apartment that she had the things that we did the lifestyle that we lived because we didn't do anything we just went to class came back to her apartment ate papa john's pizza listened to jill and slept and that was like Heaven, no clubs, no parties, no shindigs, no barbecues, no frat shit, no sorority shit. Just us in an apartment, in a room, renting movies from Blockbuster Video, eating pizza, sleeping, chilling, 
and listening to Jill Scott. I need to be able to listen to Jill Scott and eat pizza and watch movies and sleep and feel like I'm fulfilled despite not doing it with the person that I used to do those things with. It's a lot to ask for, but I got to get through it if I want to enjoy Jill because I do like to listen to Jill when I write. But also when I listen to Jill when I write, I write about pain, which is fine. I like pain, but I also want to write about stuff that made me feel good because I can only think of the bad stuff when I listen to Jill, the absence of things and the person. Jill is definitely an emotional trigger. 